So good evening to you all. Welcome aboard. My name is Ricard Nunes. I'm an airline pilot and I guess I'll be your captain, or should I say your moderator, for today's panel on the future of travel. Let's imagine it's 2071. You are attending this same event here at this amazing museum. How did you get here? Perhaps you've flown from Boston or even Tokyo in just under three hours in a supersonic or perhaps a hypersonic aircraft. Or who knows, you've just landed from your moon vacations. Or eventually, you're not even here. You're present here virtually through your favorite VR platform. So these are some of the topics we wish to cover today here with this magnificent panel with three brilliant individuals. But in, instead of me presenting them, I'm going to let them present themselves. Jenny, you want to go ahead, please? Done. Yes. Okay. Thank you all for being here. Yeah, my name is Jenny Southern. I am the editor, founder, and CEO of a company called Globe Trender, which is the UK's leading travel trend forecasting agency and online magazine dedicated to the future of travel. Um, I'm a travel journalist by trade. I've been working in the industry for about 20 years, and now my area of expertise is the future of travel. Hi everyone, I'm George Weinman. I'm from Blue Origin. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I've been involved in the aviation industry with a couple of different startup airlines in Asia. And more recently, I have, at Blue Origin, I was part of the team developing the commercial space station that we hope to replace the International Space Station and a whole host of other things that will take us back to the moon and beyond. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Greg Ombach, and I have a privilege being now in the aerospace industry, which is going through tremendous change during the next years to come. After being in the telco business, automotive, now it's time for aerospace to make a difference. Nice. Thank you so much. Uh, Jenny, let's start with you. Perhaps we've just celebrated 20 years since the last flight of the Concorde. It was actually three days ago on the 26th of November. And now we are seeing this trend of some companies trying to bring back supersonic flight as well, but some companies going the other way around actually for slower aircraft, a little bit like a Zeppelin style aircraft. What's your take on this? Do you think the future is going to be faster or it's going to be slower? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think often we have a tendency to imagine the world is just going to continue on this trajectory where everything is getting uh, harder, better, faster, stronger, you know, um, and continuing at that pace. But actually, uh, things ebb and flow, and every trend has a counter trend. So I think at the same time as uh, the, way, the speed that we travel will increase, and I do believe we will see the return of supersonic, which we'll talk about briefly in a minute, but we will also travel slower. And as a travel journalist, we're certainly noticing a desire among travelers to enjoy the journey as much as the destination. And a good example of this is uh, the Orient Express train, which I actually traveled on a couple of weeks ago from Paris to Venice. The journey took 26 hours. Uh, it could have been flown in a couple of hours at the most. Um, but I have to say it was probably the best journey of my lifetime. It was extraordinary. And this was aboard a train that was 100 years old. And it's still going, and it's still highly desirable as a travel experience. Um, the Orient Express is now being reinvented and reimagined and is going to be uh, serving Italy in the next couple of years and also Saudi Arabia. I've read that they're going to be operating services across the Saudi Arabian desert. Can you imagine this? But in the golden era, to 1920-style luxury. Um, so it's so interesting to think feel and imagine uh, what that might be and how nostalgia can also shape and a, a sort of holding on to the past can also shape our future. Um, sailing, I think, you know, again, Accor, which owns Orient Express, is building the world's largest sh sailing ship called Silent Seas, and that's going to be launching in 2026. Uh, I've also read that um, Etihad is, is planning a luxury uh, rail route from Fujira, uh, to Abu Dhabi. Um, so I think train travel is going to be continuing to take off. There's also an interesting concept train called G Train, which is described as a palace on wheels with its own garden on board. Really incredible ideas. So I do think that by 2071, we could have some of these amazing experiences available to us. Um, also, the 
slow flight, as you mentioned. Um, airships, I believe, are going to be making a return. There's a company in the UK called Hybrid Air Vehicles that are building these incredible airships that are pretty much zero emission. They're filled with helium. They can fly for a week without landing or refueling anywhere. They can take off vertically so they can land at the North Pole. You can have lunch on the North Pole. Uh, have all these wild experiences, or you can actually um, just use them for point-to-point -point journeys. So there's a Spanish airline called Air Nostrum that has ordered a fleet of these airships. Uh, I think they've put in an order of 10 airships to serve uh, regional destinations across Spain, uh, just replacing a short-haul aircraft. Um, and it will be greener. And yes, it will take longer. It will travel at 80 miles an hour versus, what is it? 500 miles an hour in a yep. commercial jet. Um, but maybe it'll be more pleasurable and enjoyable journey. Um, at the other end of the scale, you've got, uh, just very quickly, these stratospheric air, air uh, balloons that will take you up to the stratosphere in years to come for these pleasure flights, mission and star dinner on board, where you're, you can see the curvature of the Earth without actually going into space on a rocket. Um, and then you've got Boom Supersonic, which are building the next generation of supersonic uh, jets. Uh, American Airlines, United, and Japan Airlines have already put orders in for them uh, for deliveries 2029, possibly. Probably in the 2030s, uh, we can expect. So that's a little overview. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting future for sure. Talking a little bit about space, George, I know you work at Blue Origin. I guess that's a company everyone here knows quite well. So exciting times to be at that company, I believe. So I'm going to ask you really straightforward. My son is six years old. Is he going to go on vacations to the moon anytime soon? If so, is, is the technology already here? And what's the roadmap to achieve that? I don't think he'll be doing his 18th birthday on the moon, but he might be doing one of his anniversaries. Uh, so, so I think, yes, the technology for us to go back to the moon to stay and to live there sustainably is, is becoming a real uh, capability. Um, so there's the Artemis program, and as part of the Artemis program, Blue Origin is building one of the two landers to go back to land on the moon with, with human crew. Uh, initially, it'll be four crew, but what's different this time is that the lander is reusable. So it'll, it'll land on the moon, it'll conduct a mission, and then be able to fly back up to orbit. That's exciting because in the past, we've just thrown things away when we go to space, uh, which is not very efficient. Uh, it's very costly, but also isn't a great way to, uh, to go to a new land. We've learned that in the past. We want to be like good campers. You, you pack in what you pack, or pack out what you pack in. In this case, we want to be able to uh, land on the moon and come back with our assets intact. Um, but more importantly, that lander is based on hydrogen, oxygen, fuel, or propellants. And we believe we're going to be able to mine those propellants on the moon. And if you can mine water on the moon from either the regolith, which is what we call lunar soil, or from ice deposits out the South Pole, then you're able to now basically do everything you want on the moon in terms of building out new infrastructure. Uh, that infrastructure will allow us to access space at a lower cost. We won't have to bring everything from Earth. We'll be able to get it on the moon and build out resources on the moon which eventually means we can use transportation from the moon. And I'm actually a lunar environmentalist, so I actually think we should not use too much water on the moon and just blast it out the back of a spaceship uh, because then it gets lost to the cosmos. Uh, but eventually we'll be able to build solar power and other systems on the moon, uh, which will allow us to build things like rail guns, which can uh, hopefully be used for peaceful purposes of launching things off the, the lunar uh, uh, gravity well at a much lower cost. Uh, we'll be able to do other kinds of production on the moon and use moon as a staging point for further exploration of the solar system. And what's exciting about that is that the solar system is abundantly rich in resources. So we believe that once we lower the cost of access to space, we'll be able to build out infrastructure in space at a much, much lower cost than we can envision it today, which will allow us to then start building large uh, systems in space, which will then lower the cost of uh, doing things in space that we can't do on Earth. And what you don't all realize is that all of you here in the audience have a problem. You have a gravity problem. And in, in space, we can control gravity by going to different planets with different uh, levels of gravity or living in, in uh, orbit, which is microgravity, which allows us to explore physical pro processes entirely differently than we do on Earth, which is opening up whole new uh, lines of physics, material science, biological research, all of which is coming back to Earth for the benefit of 
understanding how our bi biological systems operate here on Earth. Can I ask you how long will it take from here to the moon in a commercial flight, for example? Yeah, so today using chemical propulsion, a ride to the moon is probably a four to five day affair. Uh, you would launch into low Earth orbit and then you would burn a chemical rocket to get you into a cislunar transit orbit um, and then uh, enter lunar orbit and eventually go down and land on the surface. That's a several step process. Uh, in the future, I think we're seeing a renaissance in nuclear propulsion. Nuclear propulsion will put the moon uh, probably less than a day away, uh, and it'll put Mars within about 30 days. Today, it takes about nine months to get to Mars, only once every two years. Okay, so basically one day trip to the moon. So if I can, can have a show of hands, who would like to travel to the moon, by the way? What about Mars? So I guess you have a lot of prospective clients around here. So yeah. afterwards, I think you can network a little bit. I, and I understand our, my friends from Airbus are going to give away a, a, a ticket uh, on, from one of the people sitting in the first row. Is that right? <laughs> Let's discuss it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a one in eight chance, so it's a good chance to win it. So, Greg, now to you. Uh, we're talking a little bit about sustainability, of course. COP28 is going to be here in Dubai. It's going to start, I think, in the next di later this week as well. I can see there's a model of a blended wing Airbus aircraft around there as well. So what can you tell us about Airbus? I think it's going to be possible to achieve that uh, carbon zero objective by 2071? Uh, honestly speaking, it's all about change now in aerospace industry. And uh, we are very proud as Airbus that we have this opportunity to drive this industry as the leaders here in the new direction. And already, as George mentioned about hydrogen, of course, the hydrogen is one of the sources of energy we are going to be using. And your child can be already boarded on such kind of aircraft by 2035. And then having the privilege being one of the first guests uh, or customers for the commercial, on the commercial aircraft powered by hydrogen. And uh, even our mission, we pioneer sustainable aviation for safe and united world is driving force for this, what we are doing. And if we just look at the aerospace over the last 100 years, they were incredible changes because about 100 years ago, firstly, we developed the first aircraft and we make them fly. And afterwards, from this, it was all about safety. It means how to make that these aircrafts are going to fly safely. And uh, Yuri Cardo knows best how important is safety because you are flying those aircrafts every day. And then from the safety, we moved and tried to commercialize it in that way that it is available around the world. It means it has to be available to the all people on the globe. And it happened. And if you just think, every two seconds, Airbus aircraft is taking off. It means when I am speaking already, something like 10, 15, 20 aircrafts took off globally. And this was uh, aircraft from Airbus. And Every day, about 100, 130,000 aircrafts are flying. Therefore, it's a lot and it's so safe. It's the most safety, uh, safe uh, way of the traveling from A to B. And the fourth way of, uh, I would say, revolution which is coming now is all about sustainability. It's why it's so important for us to drive proper solutions which are going to make this industry by 2050 net zero. Now, this is not one perfect solution which is going to solve all the problem. It's a combination as in every industry. When I'm looking at these cars behind us like Audi, Volkswagen and so on, this, the journey for automotive to be more sustainable took about 100 years. Already about 100 years ago, and by the way, I'm by heart automotive guy and I moved to this industry because it's so exciting now. And if you think about the automotive, in this area, we had the first combined. First, we started with electric engines, by the way, but the batteries were not ready for taking this challenge. It took us about 100 years till now to make the cars electric because of power electronics, uh, battery storage system, and so on. Now, similar journey now we have for aerospace, but in aerospace, we don't have 100 years. It means during the last 30 years or so, from the 1990s to 2020, the CO2 emissions with the incremental changes we did on aerodynamics, on new materials, on the engine efficiency improvements already were reduced about 50% compared to this what we were by 1990. Now, during the next 20 years, 
we have to reduce by the next 50%. And we are going to do it in a combination of both things. The incremental changes still, for example, the better or longer wings, and then we are already testing, maybe you have seen some, some videos on the, on the LinkedIn or YouTube and so on. We call it extra performance wing, where the wing tips are going to folding down. Then we are working, of course, on the new type of the materials in order to make them uh, lighter and more I would say intelligent in order to reduce the complexity and weight and of course we work also on the new propulsion systems it's going to be also sometimes similar to automotive going in direction like a bit hybridization we are looking how we can make it and what the value is out of this and then of course it's coming the big change with the hydrogen aircraft and the blended wing behind you there is a small model there it's a good example of the possibilities we see in this direction it is going to be blended wing? I don't know yet, because we are working on the technology bricks in order to find the best way to deliver on this ambition. And at the same time, it's not just about the aircraft. It's also about the infrastructure. And very short term, we can already apply sustainable aviation fuel to this, what we are doing. And uh, already by 2030, all aircrafts we are going to produce are going to be 100% sustainable fuel proofed. And already today, uh, the, some portion of the fuel is, is, is so no SAF, sustainable aviation fuel. It's still not enough because it's in the below 1% in the global use, but takeoff is going to happen. We, with our partners here globally, also here in the region, working on creating those, those or mobilizing the sustainable aviation fuel opportunities. And at the same time, we have to think about the next wave, where the green hydrogen is going to come from. And here we are talking about the green energy. And therefore, it's about the sun, it's about the solar, it's about the wind. And then this region is also the perfect place where those green hydrogen is going to be generated. And at the same time, we should not forget, we have to still capture some CO2 from the air. It is all about so no direct air capture, which in combination with the hydrogen can be used to create synthetic aviation fuel, which can be then used for aircrafts. Already during the next weeks or so, we are going to see the first airlines which are going to use 100% SAF on the journeys. Therefore, I'm really very excited about this variety of opportunities we have because it's not just about the one solution, it's about the different solutions which are going to drive us towards 2050 net zero challenge. That's actually really amazing. Now a little bit down to earth again. Jenny, back to you. I want to hear your thoughts a little bit about virtual reality. Do you think the technology will be there in such a way that in-person person traveling will be obsolete? Yeah, again, it's a good question. Um, I think uh, where we are right now with the technology that we already have is we're probably, you know, in terms of VR and the metaverse, we're probably in the what we call the trough of disillusionment. We have experimented with it, not been very impressed, and don't quite know what's coming next and how it's gonna be useful. Um, I'd like to ask you all who, if anyone's done a meeting in the metaverse, put your hand up. Okay, there's a few people, there's about 12 people, cool. Um, and I'm imagining everyone was doing meetings uh, on Zoom in the pandemic, uh, probably attending conferences, in, in the pandemic, and yet here we all are choosing to travel to a real world destination to meet in person, in spite of the fact that we already have the technology to stay at home or be in our office and uh, participate. So I think that is an indicator of even if the technology was there, there will be pushback because we are human beings and we like being in real physical places with real people. Um, I do think there are interesting use cases for it, and it will be part of our lives by 2071. Um, Can you share some I, examples I think with us? It, yeah, definitely. I think for educational purposes, for inspiring children, uh, young people, anyone who can't travel for whatever reason, they can't afford it, they may be disabled in some way, they may be ill, they might be very old. Um, that opens up all sorts of exciting opportunities for them to have immersive experiences and escape 
uh, the confines of where they are physically living. Um, I think that that will be the opportunity. I also think there's an interesting opportunity for using it to sell travel, and that's what a few companies already are starting to do, to give a taster of what it might be like to, to go to that certain place, and then maybe you'll book it, especially in the luxury travel realm where you're spending a lot of money on something. Um, but the data that I wanted to share with you shows that travel is going to continue to accelerate um, over the next decades. You know, you've got just by 2023, 8,500 new private jets being delivered. Um, you've got... And those aircraft are going to have a lifespan of, what, 20 years? probably, so that takes you up to 2060. Um, you're going to see uh, probably, in terms of air passenger numbers, uh, n next year we're looking at six points, no, no, 9.4 billion uh, global air passengers. It's an all-time high. 9.4 billion in 2041. We're talking about 20 billion. So double the number of air passengers by just by 2040. I mean, this is again assuming that everything is going to continue in that trajectory. And as we know, the world is a fragile place. Things can go awry. We can't take everything for granted. There could be something that happens that means we do not carry on in this, in this way. So of course, and the pandemic was a good example of that. Exactly. I want to talk a little bit about automation now, um, maybe for you, George. And I'm a little biased because I want to keep my job. So I don't want to be unemployed soon. But we now have self-driving cars, self-driving drones. We are already testing automation in aircraft as well. I know Blue Origin rockets are completely automated, so. Yeah, it's true. Today, uh, if you fly to the International Space Station, you are flying on a rocket that's controlled by a computer. Uh, there is there is no pilot on board. They sometimes they give a person on the flight the title of pilot, and that person's really is more like a flight attendant uh, than they are a pilot. Uh, they're not actually controlling the direction or, or trajectory of the spacecraft, and I think that's going to be the way we're going to do things going forward. Um, the old space shuttle actually had the capability of auto land, and uh, the spacecraft commander almost always turned off the autopilot so they could land the shuttle themselves, uh, being they were all. That's ex something we do. Yes, that's pilots are tend that be that. Way. I'm a pilot too. Um, but I think that uh, the automation that we're learning in the space environment, and space is harder in every respect things that we do on Earth. Uh, it's more deadly. The, um, the systems have to be more precise. The uh, systems themselves are very fragile. Uh, you could poke, take a screwdriver and poke a hole through the spacecraft body usually if you really wanted to. So you have to be very, very careful. And I think that the precision and the tolerances that we're learning um, for spaceflight are now coming back into other aspects of aerospace uh, and will allow automation to be done with a more higher confidence level. Um, I, I also think that just if I could talk about uh, virtual reality for a second, uh, not everybody's going to go to space, uh, but some people will, and those people are going to be lonely, and they're going to want their family members and others to be there with them. And I think we're going to see uh, these kinds of applications are going to help drive virtual reality and um, in, in whatever way you want to define that, whether it's holograms. I think they tested a hologram on the International Space Station recently. Uh, it, was a, it was a doctor doing a remote medicine exercise with a, an astronaut, and they had a hologram there to demonstrate what they wanted to do. Um, I think we're going to see more of that so that a family member who can afford to fly to space uh, for whatever reason can bring their family with them virtually uh, for, for periods of time. Uh, and the reverse, true, uh, is also true. So things that we're doing in space, it's very expensive for astronaut time. That's going to get lower. It's going to get cheaper. But it's never going to be as cheap as walking into a lab on Earth. But you could have a recreated digital twin laboratory on Earth that's doing everything that's happening on the space station or simulating it. And you could have an entire team of researchers on Earth pretending like they're there in that facility. And I think that type of technology will apply to Earth uh, activities as well. And lastly, you talked about how many travelers there are by air. Um, this is just my personal guess, don't quote uh, Blue Origin for this, but I, I believe that uh, based on uh, demographics and macroeconomics, so not any kind of uh, individual study or personal preference, just how I see the overall wealth of nations and peoples increasing, 
that we're going to see a much larger number of nations participating in space flight. So this is going to be a global phenomenon, not a, just a few countries. And second, I think by the 20, late 2030s, early 2040s, you'll have uh, tens of people going into space just because they want to. And by the mid-2040s to the end of 2040s, that could reach up to hundreds of people. And by the 2070s, we might be in the thousands of people. Um, and that's just based not on, on the technology, but on the macroeconomics of wealth in the world. So back in 1905, there were a very small number of people who could afford cars. Uh, now we all own a car. Uh, and that's, you know, a hundred years transition. So I think, I think it's, a, it's very exciting to see how, how many nations, uh, the countries of Southeast Asia, even some the Africa as a whole, have sufficient resources now to actually actively participate in human spaceflight. And I think we're going to only see that increase dramatically in the future. That's amazing. It is an expanding market for sure. And finally, we've seen here today a lot of lectures about AI, quantum computers. So, Greg, I want to talk to you a little bit about this in aerospace. So how can we leverage this kind of technology, big data, quantum, AI, into building new airplanes, new platforms, or improving the life of passengers, for example? Uh, I think the data, the data is, is a key, okay? And uh, we're already using a lot of data in, in aerospace because the main paramount is about making it safe. Therefore, we have to collect a lot of data, analyze it, and use it properly. Now, if, if we think about how it can be even better used, and then when we have heard from Jenny, during the next 20 years, guys, the number of the aircraft is going to double based on the current prognosis we have. It means something like about 70% of the aircrafts which are flying today are going to be exchanged with the new aircrafts, which are much more modern, which are uh, also more efficient, about 20, 30%. Just by exchanging, you can save so much CO2. Now, the next paramount is to find out how this data can help us to improve what we do in the four areas. The one area is about the new aircraft design. It means here, of course, the new engineering tools uh, in order to make it quicker, better, with less trials, is going to reduce the cost and drive us to make those aircrafts more efficient and uh, from the performance also better, of course. Then the second area is about from the design when we move to production. The production systems which we know today in aerospace industry are something like 30 years old. Even with some adoptions, it's not the same like in automotive where the life cycle of the cars or electronics where it's two years, in the cars is about seven to 10 years. In the aerospace business, the life cycle is about something like 30 to 50 years. And you, you, I, when I started working for Airbus and then coming from automotive where I last time did the production line for the battery for Porsche Taycan as yeah, my baby, there was automatization percentage of something like about 75-80%. When you look the same production lines for the aircrafts, then we are talking about a few percent of automatization. Therefore, they are completely in the different areas. There's a lot of manual work. Therefore, a lot of the improvements we are going to see from the data, from the new industrial systems in that area with the new designs as well. It's going to be combined between design and operations, it means production, how we are going to use data, data more clever with, of course, AI and machine learning behind. Now, very imp important change is going to happen in operation. Because in the operation, if you would like to operate two times more aircrafts in the, uh, at the same time, you could imagine is going to be challenge. And you, Ricardo, know by heart, when you are coming to the airport which is congested, you have to take the roads around the airport, wait in the air, where you are losing a lot of the CO2 and, and fuel burn during this time. Therefore, it's all about how you are going to bring this data with automatization in the game that, of course, Ricardo is not going to lose his job, but he's Hopefully. going Yeah, I, I count on this, but nevertheless, At the same time, you can think about 
we just recently did the test. We took the two 350s and we flew them from Europe to west to East Coast. And we flew them in the distance of about two, two three nautical miles. And the second aircraft was flying on the turbulences of the first aircraft. You could imagine like the birds are migrating from the north to the south during the winter and coming to the summer and so on. They are keep making the chain in order to use the energy of the birds in front of you to reduce the drag and get some lift. And also this nice symbol here of the blue origin is also about birds. Therefore, these guys are looking also the nature as we do. Therefore, what was happening, if you do it right with the aircrafts, you are reducing immediately the fuel burn, something like 4 to 5% less fuel burn if you can do it. But you cannot do it just manually by having the two pilots and trying to adjust the position and so on. This has to be more automatic. And for this, you need more sensors, more connectivity, more data. And then for this as well, you need, of course, the machine learning, which is going to help you to optimize those positions on the aircrafts to, for example, reduce this fuel burn. And guys, I could be talking for hours how the data is going to change. Because if we just look to the cabin, and the, let's be honest, the cabin on the aircrafts is not as exciting as it should be for passengers. And we talk about the metaverses and so on. Stay tuned because next year there are going to be quite interesting announcements going in the direction as well. Nice, it's very insightful. And before we pass to the key one a because I'm expecting a lot of you want to make some questions, I'm going to ask the three of you to, in just one word, what do you think the future of travel will be? Maybe we'll start with you, Greg. Uh, I would say uh, disruptive. Disruptive, good one. George? Brilliant. Good one as well. And you, Jenny? It's a tough, tough job now. Paradoxical. Paradoxical, good. So maybe we're going to start the Q&A. So anyone wants to make any question? You have the microphone? Oh, was wondering about your thoughts on uh, whether the future travel means that we will be able to discover more places on the planet that currently it's very difficult to go to, it's inaccessible, it's dangerous, um, and whether this and what this means for humanity in terms of the fact that we that people get to exchange different cultures and and just tourism spreads beyond just the traditional places where we go today. I'm going to jump on that one. Okay, so, okay, so, George, you're so, quicker. So yeah. Uh, First we are talking about I, this planet, okay? I, I, yes, I yes, think yes. This planet. Uh, <laughs> although I think you could apply it to other planets too. Um, but I, I am one to sign up for the airship flight. Uh, I, I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic to have essentially um, the ability to treat an airship like a cruise ship um, and to go to places that we, we really wouldn't want to take cruise ships because uh, it's not it's not comfortable being on the on the seas in the South Sea, for example, or other. You know, you can't take a cruise ship into the Amazon. Um, so I think it, there's going to be all sorts of new things that open up to us. In fact, I would, I would argue that because we become so dependent on our lives operating around a digital economy, you can take most of your life with you in a small suitcase. And so you can live in a much reduced way. I mean, it's not like the old days with steamer trunks where you would go, go someplace for a long trip. You take, you know, f 500 pounds of luggage. So I think we're going to see... Uh, communities of people who don't have a very strong home base and even start creating new places to live uh, where they're living uh, in a much different way than we envision today because travel enables it. This is actually a very good question and if I can chip in as well, talk a little bit about over tourism as well because it's becoming a trend too. I don't know if any one of you guys want to, maybe Jenny, you want to? Jen, Jenny is a perfect if you're talking about tourism. Okay, yeah. I mean, over-tourism, I think, is a major problem for us. Um, we're already seeing uh, people returning to the world's most popular destinations in their thousands and millions after the pandemic. Paris is set to be the number one most visited destination next year, helped, of course, by the fact that it's hosting the Olympics. Uh, but, you know, with the rise of... the continued rise of social media uh, everyone wants to be photographed in that bucket list iconic location and you know that just keeps being perpetuated you know we all want to go to those popular places and, and be pictured there um, but I think on the other hand the paradox is and the hope is that tourism can be used more of a for, as a force for good the more we inspire people and give opportunities for people to get to access 
lesser known places that can uh, bring in money and opportunities that to benefit local people and also contribute to conservation of to destinations that may otherwise be bulldozed. Um, and a good example, just a small example, but there's an amazing hotelier called Bill Bensley, um, who already has a couple of properties, one in the Cambodian rainforest, where he's actually bought the land and has recruited former poachers to act as wildlife rangers to then protect that environment. And he's building a, a similar property in the Republic of the Congo, which is described as one of the most beautiful, like, last untouched places on Earth. And his presence there will mean that this area of wilderness is protected. So I think there's hope um, as well in, in, in when, when done well. Uh, and if I can just add on that, on top on that one, as already we discussed, in the next 20 years, double of the, the aircrafts and then something like four times more travelers. The four this is already showing how this industry and gives opportunity to the people to be in the different places. And uh, if you think today about the countries, uh, that the cheapest way to connect A and B on the, on, the, on the average or bigger distance is not to build the uh, rail stations and the tram and uh, the trains between those, but to build the two airports and then infrastructure is there. But we have to take care about this infrastructure, which is R. And for this, we have to develop these new technologies which we are working on in order to make or be able to move the people from A to B to give them this opportunity without the impact on the climate. And this is the paramount because without this, maybe we are not going to travel at all. Therefore, for us, this is the most job which we have to be do, which we have to do uh, in order to ensure that this industry can grow and give opportunity to unite the world and not to divide it. Yeah, I'd just like to quickly add that I do think in terms of the global tourism industry, we're at a tipping point whether it, where it, we can either put us on a more positive trajectory or it's going to go downhill and be really awful because we're already seeing the impacts of climate change. We're going to see travelers uh, doing what we, I, at Globetrender, we described as climate evasion. So when it comes to planning your summer holiday, you're going to be rethinking going to the Mediterranean because, frankly, 48 degrees is unbearable. Um, and you, maybe it's better to go to the Nordics instead. And so people are going to be thinking in a different way about this. And if it's overcrowding and extreme heat and wildfires, Maybe we'll just stay at home. And I am sure as a tourist, when you are going to be boarding the aircraft, you'd like to be sure that your impact on the, on the nature is, is, is not as, as it is today. Therefore, it's, you know, it's on us to make it happen because if take on the future of these and similar technologies? Who wants to take charge in this? George, you're looking at me, eh? Well, I, I mean, we can debate it. I think yeah, that, I'm, I'm uh, flying. You know? I, I think that we're going to see uh, a number of different technologies in, in future transportation. Um, the, the beauty of Hyperloop uh, or something like it, it basically uh, some kind of evacuated tunnel, is that it, it makes more sense for short distances. Um, if you want to go New York to Tokyo, uh, we may have rockets that will do that someday. Um, but you're not going to take a you're not going to take a, a hyperloop to Tokyo. But if you want to go from New York to Atlanta, or let's say Riyadh to Dubai, Los Angeles uh, to San Francisco, th then a faster airplane uh, runs into certain physical limits because of the atmosphere. You have sonic booms, and we'll get better at dealing with sonic booms, but they're going to have to go really, really super high. Uh, and that's not efficient for short distances. So I think the Hyperloop has this sort of, or like I said, technologies like it, has a place in medium range distances, short, short to medium range distances. Uh, beyond that, I think uh, the congestion of the loop it will, will make it inefficient. Um, and that's where air transportation or even space transportation will, will have its, uh, have its uh, strong suit.
At the end of the day, it's not just about one solution. It's about a combination of the various solutions, and the Hyperloop is going to be one of them. Although today already you have in Japan or in China or in Europe also some 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 uh, trains which are go we are which are doing 400 kilometers per hour. Therefore, they are already solutions which which are working in that direction. And I think it's about the combination because there's no one solution that fits all. Therefore, we need we need many, and, and like, also like this uh, uh, eVTOL, which is hanging be behind. Uh, it's from the Lilium, uh, and there are many companies which are working on this. There was also hype in that direction, and hopefully, we are going to be seeing something in that way or in that direction during the next years to come, uh, to see some point to point, uh, some eVTOLs flying and bringing people from the airports to the downtowns and so on. Therefore, I think it's uh, the future is from the. Uh, transportation perspective, and if we think about using air as a as a uh, travel mean, it's going to be exciting if we do it right. Uh, yeah, it's a good if, one. If, it's a good if, one. If you go fast enough to Alpha uh, Centauri, then we'll get you some time travel, but not quite what you think. So, okay, next one, please. Um, I'd like to ask more about the future of agritourism. Uh, where do you think this is going to uh, to be and how would it look like? And especially that we're having uh, currently two uh, points of view that are growing. One that's going more towards globalization that the whole world is going to be one single identity. And another one that is going to more that people are returning back. That's a lovely question, and it's uh, yeah definitely something I've looked at. Um, I stayed in a lovely little agro-tourism place in uh, Ibiza, a small hotel that was fairly self-sufficient, actually. Permaculture, vegetable plots, orange and olive groves, and this is a wonderful model, I think, uh, to look at, and it's something that can be replicated in all sorts of interesting ways. And in fact, what I'm talking about uh, when I do consulting with uh, hotel brands is showing them how actually for a five-star hotel, even in a city, you can be somewhat self-sufficient. There are really interesting examples of, I know this isn't quite agritourism, but it's interesting to think about uh, you know, rooftop gardens and, and vertical farming and all these kinds of things. But I think um, in terms of agritourism, I think that as we become continue to become so over-technologized, there's that desire, that longing to be more connected with nature, and especially for people who live in cities. So I think the opportunity to actually go and pick your own tomatoes is going to become the next like luxury status symbol for many people, ironically. Um, but yeah, so I actually think it's gonna. There's a huge opportunity for growth there, and also for yeah, again, directing money straight into the hands of, of local people. Thank you.